Hey, what's happening out there? This is Halftime Prep Talk. HTPT is sponsored by Fannin Automotive Family. Joined by Zach Quimmy, I'm Aaron Snyder. We have special guest Jeremy Howe coming in today uh, from Ashland Boys Basketball. He was just named the coach this week. So we look forward to talking to him. If you look on the bottom of your screen, of course, all this is weather pending <laughs> these days in the spring, but uh, the distinctive specialties ticker will give you some games, maybe some ideas for some things to do this weekend. So hit, hit the diamond if it's not raining. Uh, we got some ba local uh, high school baseball and softball to get to, but first I got to talk about the loss I took last week, and that was the Masters. Uh, Zach Clemmy took uh, Louis Oosthuizen in the bet that we had, the little friendly wager we had, with, which we've actually cut down. This is, this is actually his suggestion, not mine. We're just going to play nine holes at either uh, Sandy Creek or Diamond Links, and i got to pay for the round. Well, I mean, 18 holes with us could turn into like an eight-hour <laughs> affair, so who has time for that? <laughs> yeah, and uh, how many golf balls will we lose uh, in that time? One hole, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I took J.B. Holmes, and uh, he, he didn't do as hot as he had been doing. Uh, he was four over on that first day. Played a little better the second day, but uh, just didn't have it. Just didn't yeah. have it. I, I, don't, I, I knew there was a risk pick you know, going into it. Augusta isn't necessarily conducive to his style of play, um, so I should have... I should have been a little smarter than that, but well, yeah. like you said, I'm a homer. It happens. I took a Kentucky guy. That's all right. All right, let's go to out of left field. And, Zach, you take it away. What, what's our topic this week? Uh, so an area where we kind of address a random topic of some level of importance in the area or even maybe nationally. And, and this week, just kind of an offbeat thing, you look at Boyd County's softball field has been flooded for the fifth time in about the last month and a half. Uh, and so it's no – uh, unusual sight to, to be driving down 60 out that direction toward Cannonsburg and see um, a, a boat maybe floating across center field and Jeff Stewart chasing after it madly trying to catch his boat and get it cleaned up. So <laughs> oh, I know. Well, I feel bad for him. I it's, do it's, too. It's, just a, it's a bad place for a softball field, but there's not a whole lot they can do about it right now. So I know, and, and you know, the baseball field, they're dealing with the same thing, talking to Brandon Ramsey uh, mm -hmm. on Wednesday morning. You know, he said it's going to be an all-day affair out there, you know, working on that field and getting it ready. Uh, I know they got a, uh, you know some games coming up there, and it's just it's, it's a trying spring, mm -hmm. pretty much every spring at mm -hmm. Boyd County, just keeping those fields, uh, you know, dry. I mean, like you said, the softball field is just in, the, in a position mm -hmm. there. I think it's an elevation thing, or if I know there's creeks running around that area. There's, there's a creek right next there. to the baseball field. So right. The football practice field, I mean, they're trying to have spring practice, and that's underwater, so mm -hmm. it's just kind of one of those things. It really is, yeah. Um, following uh, BC Athletics on Twitter, mm -hmm. they, they posted a, a, a good picture of it, and it really gave a good depiction of what they're doing with right. Uh Let's play two. We're going to hand out our game balls, and uh, I think we're going to both stay on the baseball diamond this week. Mm -hmm. You know, for the past week performances, you know, with with the intermittent rain and everything uh, interrupting some some play, uh, we still have several we could choose from. I'm going to go with Russell's Heath Hensley. Um, they called him Mega Mitt for a while because mm -hmm. he, he was playing first base, but he's been playing some outfield this year. Very versatile player. Signed with University of Charleston in the off season. He's batting like 750 over the last three games. Uh, you know, always. Uh, kind of a pest for the other team on base too, and scoring several runs. And you know they played uh, Fleming County in a doubleheader like this past Saturday, and then then they beat Lewis in nine innings on Monday night. And they were scheduled to play Lewis County on Wednesday night as well. Of course, we taped this on Wednesday afternoon. So uh, Heath Hensley playing very well, leading the Red Devils team. Well, uh, Wes Carter, he's a senior. Uh, he is. Heath Hensley is, and you put Wes Carter is. Very youth heavy. Uh, they're very talented, but they're very young. And one of those guys that kind of embodies both of those is J.T. Johnson. He's mm -hmm. a freshman uh, infielder slash pitcher and uh, made some big plays on Saturday in the semifinals and the finals of the All-A Classic at Morgan County. Um, came in in, in relief and, and won the championship game against Raceland through two perfect innings and, and made kind of a wedge in play on a, on a hot shot up the middle to end it. So uh, also kind of an offensive catalyst and a pest you mentioned. Hensley and, and Johnson's kind of the same way. Very young guy, but but uh, something that people keep mentioning about this West Carter team, these are freshmen and sophomores, a lot of them, but they play travel ball, so they play, you know, 80 or 100 games a summer, so they play maybe 30, 
baseball games for, for Wes Carter a year, but that doesn't mean they've only played about 30 baseball games. They've played a, a whole lot of baseball, and you can tell they look experienced even despite their youth. So yeah. JT Johnson had a big night Saturday night. And, he, you know, he started all year as an eighth grader last mm-hmm. year. Um, and, you know, his father, Tim, is, a, is the coach there. Mm-hmm. I think Wes Carter could have a special few years here, yeah. uh, and it could go down in, in the history yeah. for West Carter and baseball. J, JT's earned the starting spot, too. His dad is not oh, easy exactly. on him. If you interview, ever interview uh, Tim about his, his son after a game, if he doesn't play well, he'll let you know about it. So he's, and he's, a lot of times Tim won't name him. He'll just say right. the second baseman. The second baseman did not have a good <laughs> night or something. Yeah, but, but JT's certainly having more good nights than he is by it. So. No doubt. Let's go to covering the bases. First topic we'll tackle is uh, – the All A Classic, uh, Randy Vanderhoof, the uh, longtime Raceland baseball coach, always has some strong opinions on this subject. Um, I know Zach, you covered some of the All A, so uh, talk about a little bit what, what we've seen over the past few years in this in this tournament, and you know, can can there be a change? Will there be a change as far as you know, just the size of, size of the schools involved? Right. Well. Uh... Randy Vanderhoof mentioned after Saturday's game that, uh, you know, we're playing against a 3A school in West Carter in the championship game, and not only are they a 3A football school, which is their football classification, but they're a good one. They're a team that that has the capability to challenge for the region title, not just the all-A region title. So, you know, you lose a a one-run game to a team like that in the finals, and you're sitting there thinking, well, what else do we have to do? Raceland's enrollment is much smaller than West Carter's and, and that sort of deal. And he mentioned, you know, this is not really a Class A tournament despite what they call it. Um, the All-A Classic does have a rule. I'm not exactly sure what it is about enrollment, and it's not limited just to Class A football schools or, or schools of that size. And uh, there are three, uh, three teams that are in Class 3A football classification that play in it, and that's Morgan and West Carter and Bath County, which not coincidentally perhaps are the last three teams to win the region All-A baseball championship. And that uh, I'm sure will have, that fact has not escaped Raceland, but. Um, yeah, the last true Class A team to win the All-A Classic was Fairview in 2012. 2012, right. And you look at West Carter as a team, you know, that, that could, could make some noise in the region. And the year Bath County won it in, in 2013, uh, they could have maybe, if they, they have a tough district, but if they could get out of that, they could have made some noise there too. Um, so it's you wonder if it is if the All-A Classic has gotten away from the founding principles of really giving the small schools that have no chance to win the region a chance to win a region. Um, the flip side of that is that Raceland baseball might have a shot. They, they play in a tough district, but they could be a dark horse to, to make some noise in the region too, mm-hmm. so it'll be interesting to keep an eye yeah, on that. Yeah, definitely May, a chance for May redemption there for Raceland because, right. you know, I know they put a lot of stock in that all eight, and, and that's, you know, that's one of their best, their, their ultimate goals all, uh, you know, every season mm-hmm. uh, for Vanderhoof squad is to win that all eight tournament. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thing about it is, you know, sometimes Russell is even qualified. Right. Uh, for the all-A, so it, it kind of varies as far as, you know, right. uh, enrollment sizes and things like that. So I don't know that you would say that the Class A or the all-A Classic is totally broken because you look like, for example, L.A. County basketball has won the last two. They they would be a true Class A. They don't even have football. Right. Raceland softball has won two straight. They would be a true Class A school. So some sports, I mean, Bath County won the girls' basketball, and they are not a, a Class A school. But it, it's, it works sometimes, and it doesn't sometimes, it seems like. But uh, I guess we understand – Coach Vanderhoof's frustration about the system. Let's talk about one-two punches in uh, softball. Uh, you look at, uh, as far as the pitching circle goes, Boyd, Boyd County softball ha- has Laura Thompson mm-hmm. and Hannah Irvin. Uh, East Carter has Morgan Jacobs, Montana Fouts, mm-hmm. Ashland with Megan Murphy and Megan Hensley. Um, you know, uh, some really good one-two punches in the pitching circle in high school softball. Right, no doubt. And, uh, kind of talking to Rocky Stanley earlier, it's, there aren't a whole lot, there used to be, there were not a whole lot of teams that would pitch more than one girl. Um, and, and you would have somebody at the end of a season who thrown 100 innings or 120 innings or whatever, and her arm was about to fall off, but that's not necessarily the case. I think a lot of people have found out if you want to be competitive at the All-A State Classic or at the state tournament, then you need to have more than one pitcher. And um, Teams like Raceland, for example, also is, is in that group. They've gone out and really put some emphasis on developing more than one pitcher. Boyd County maybe has the, the best one-two punch probably right now, but there's three or four others that have more than one good pitcher. Yeah, I know. You know, Laura Thompson, she she gets a lot of attention and gets a lot of ink from us because she has some big games both at the plate and right. in the circle. But uh, like you mentioned before, Hannah Irvin 
uh, she's been pivotal to that team as well. Mm-hmm. And they're two very different style pitchers. Irvin is, is not an overpowering pitcher. She gets ground balls and, and lets her defense get involved. And so far, that's worked out really well. Boyd County's off to a, a really good start this year. And, and you know, they're, they're two, kind of their one-two punches. Despite the flooding. Despite the flooding, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you mentioned Raceland too. Riley Austin and Kelsey Diller mm-hmm. are uh, fine pitchers as well. All right, moving on to the third topic of covering the bases. Let's go with Lawrence County softball. Uh, you know, they made some noise. Uh, they're 7-5, they're and five, but they beat Russell. They nearly beat Ashland. Uh, you know, is this a team that could threaten Johnson Central's reign in the 15th region? I think, well, we've looked at what they've been able to do. They gave Ashland a, a great game last week, and they came in and they beat Russell. And I think their last game before this taping was Rowan County uh, edged them out. But, uh, you know, those are good quality teams in, sure. this, in this region and in this area. And if Lawrence is playing close to them, then... Um, Kind of looking back through some stuff last year, they they gave Johnson Central all they wanted in a district semifinal last year, and you know that's a Johnson Central team that went on to uh, almost win a game at the state tournament against Ashland last year. And depending on who you ask, maybe they did actually win it. But um, you know, if Lawrence is on that same level as Johnson Central, then that certainly bodes well for their program. And Johnson Central is ten and off to a ten and three start mm-hmm. this year. Uh, we're going to bring in. Jeremy Howe of Ashland Boys Basketball. Uh, he was just hired as the coach this week. He's 29 years old. Um, he is the second youngest hire in Ashland Tomcat history. Uh, Steve Gilmore was 28 in 1972, and he went uh, 22 and five in his mm-hmm. first season. Steve Gilmore did. Uh, now uh, Ashland is trying to avoid uh, back-to-back losing seasons. Uh, they haven't done that. They haven't experienced that since 88, 89, 89, 90 seasons. Um, so. Uh, Jeremy Howe has, knows he has a lot on his plate, but he embraces it, and Absolutely. we're going to talk to him about that. All right, Jeremy Howe joins the HTPT set, the new Ashland boys basketball coach. How does that sound? Oh, it sounds great. It's got a nice ring to it. That <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's great. I love it. Uh, it's it's baseball season. You're a baseball fan? Big time. Big time Reds fans. Uh, even, even though we uh, moved to Florida, um, right after college, followed the Reds five and three right now. Uh, big hopes for them this year. What do you, What do you think they need to need to do to maybe contend for the playoffs this year? As you know, baseball's pitching. Starts with pitching, ends with pitching. Um, like to see Votto keep it up. Votto's a big deal. Um, they can get another fielder. I think we'll be okay. Well, you know, talking with Mark Swift, the athletic director at Ashland, fifty plus applications and or resumes sent to him. Uh, you know, to be chosen and be deemed the one that, that, that they want right now to, you know, to lead this program, what does that mean to you? Uh, one word, it's humbling. Um, these, last, these last probably 48 hours have uh, put a lot of things in perspective. Um, a lot of people have reached out um, that I haven't heard from in a while, who I've heard from yesterday. Um, it, it, it means the world. Um, bring us back to where we were. Um, do the best you can. Uh, we're pulling for you. Community members, family members, friends. Um, and I know there's a lot of pressure on it. I mean, I knew that when I, when I filled that application out and sent it in. Um, and as I said, if I wasn't qualified or I didn't think I could do it, I wouldn't have applied. Uh, you know, looking at it, Ashland is coming off a 5-27 and season. It, right now they're in the longest drought in history as far as 16th region titles go. But I was looking at it, you know, one common characteristic of these teams, especially since 2003, there's no Jeremy Howe on the roster. Maybe that's the reason. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> I wish we could say that. Um, I made my living, everybody knows, uh, my junior year, spotting up in the corner, just knocking down the shot. <laughs> when we had uh, Mark Sergowski fanning it out to me. We had, we had a great team at uh, Adam Howard, Arliss Beach, Zach Davis, you name it. I mean, we were a really good team, but uh, – it's five and twenty-seven. It's hard to swallow as a, as an alumni, as a fan in general of Ashland. Um, we're going to try to take it one day at a time. Um, as I keep saying, it's not built in a day. We're going to attack it, go one day at a time, and try to build on it for uh, for future success. What do you think the reason is that that there hasn't been a region title, or the biggest reason in the last thirteen years? Uh, it, you know, sports. It comes in waves. Um, I think this is our little wave. If if we do win next year uh, or the following year, I, I mean, it's it'll be a blessing, yes. There's no reason uh, we shouldn't contend every single year. Um, I think we should make regional tournament, and we have. Um, and as you know, once you get down there, anything can happen. Mm-hmm. And 
we've been in there the last few years, but uh, we, we just haven't got over the got over the hump, unfortunately. And you know, like I talked about with Coach Biggs, some really quality teams that have represented the region at Sweet 16. You know, some tough hurdles to clear. Oh, no question. Between Rowan County and Fleming County, the last few years, I mean, they've basically they've owned the region. Uh, they've had the best players. They've had uh, two best coaches. Um, because those players aren't getting there without the coaches. I know it's all about the players, and that's what we're going to emphasize at Ashland, but uh, they've had the best quality of talent the last few years. You know, talking about talent, you know, you guys have some guys coming back, especially, uh, you know, with, with a lot of varsity experience now. Uh, you can look at it that way for sure. Christian Viller is a high-scoring guard. Uh, Noah Roberts, he, he pounds the glass pretty well. Dylan Lucas, uh, Josh Bradley, um, you know, the list goes on. You, you got – of several guys coming back. Right. Uh, pretty pleased about that. Um, that was one of our, um, I guess you could say, down or faults this past year. Uh, we didn't have any experience. Uh, Nick Miller was the only kid we had back with any of type of experience. Got injured. Gets injured early on, and then it's kind of a snowball from there, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm pleased. Each one of those gentlemen you named, uh, they bring something different to the table. Um, I'm excited. Uh, they're already working hard, each and every one of them. I just saw them about 30 minutes ago in the weight room, um, and they're all getting after it pretty well. What was the players' reaction to the announcement that you were the head coach? Uh, I think it was uh, a little excitement. Um, I wouldn't say disbelief is not a, not a good word, but just uh, kind of amazed. Uh, Mr. Swift walked me down to the locker room, and uh, they kind of stopped him, had the whole basketball team there, and uh, he announced it. He kind of let me have my time uh, with the team, and they were they were pretty joyous. I mean, it was claps, laughs, smiles. I, try, I mean, it's kind of a blur. I try to take it all in, but uh, it, it's a it's a great feeling knowing that uh, the re, with the rapport I have with the kids that they were excited. And of course, you know you you've developed that over the years. Over the past five years, you've been an assistant on the staff. So, uh, and of course, you know they all know your your background too that you played there and were a national guy. So uh, looking, you know, at what you're going to focus on, you talked to Rocky Stanley the other day about mm -hmm. how you're going to harp on defense. Yes. Is that the main point of emphasis? Has to be. Um, if you don't play any defense, as you know, you're not winning anything. And that goes almost in every sport. Um, I think we can get better, a lot better, um, on the defensive side of things. We got kids that can score the basketball. Um, that, that shouldn't be a problem, but it's stopping the opponent. That's going to be the big key this year. It's making sure in the half court we can stop those kids. Last few years, I think you guys have been about the best dressed staff in the region. The suits and ties are rocking usually on the sideline for Ashland. Sure. So yes. Are you going to keep that going? Uh, I definitely am. Uh, I, I like the look. It feels good. I think we may uh, switch it up a little bit, maybe some tournaments, throw a polo on uh, here and there. Um, kind of dress down, feel loose, uh, let them know we have a different side to us. So. Uh, you lived in uh, Florida for a little while. Yes. Um, what What was that experience like? It was Jacksonville area, yes, I think. Yes. And uh, what was that experience like, and uh, what made you come back? Loved it. Uh, my wife and I, after we graduated college, she uh, attended law school. I got a job with uh, uh, Allstate Insurance down there and uh, worked for them in Enterprise Rent a Car for a few years and loved it. Loved the weather. As you can imagine, it's yeah. Florida. Uh, <laughs> big Jacksonville Jaguars fan, um, which I get. I get a, a, enough heckling from that, let me tell you. I mean, between them <laughs> and the Browns, down years. Unfit, uh, yes, unfortunately. I mean, it's it's been rough, but, man, it was, uh, it, it was a nice time in life to, to experience uh, right after college and came back due to family illness, and it, it's been great. It's been great being back, being around family, um, and having that support system around. Um, yeah, you know, you, talk, you talked about uh, being married uh, to a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Devin Reams Howell is Jeremy Howell's wife. Uh, I, I was just wondering, you know, do you win any arguments at home? <laughs> Personally, I think I do. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, I know my tally marks aren't as high as hers. Um, I've learned when to stop and when to go, um, but she, uh, for the for the most part, she's the winner. We'll, we'll let her hear that. So. <laughs> and uh, you know, a new addition uh, to the family recently, eleven month old Stella. Yes. Uh, what's the what's the you know a couple of the biggest changes there? Uh, not, not uh, as much sleep. That's one. Yeah. I look at. I know how that uh, is. <laughs> we just finally got her going to sleep. Uh, that's the big thing. But uh, she she is all over the place already. As, as I've told you, uh, walking around everywhere. Um, only at eleven months old. Already already all over the place. <laughs> and we don't we don't watch as much TV as we can. The DVR is full. Uh, I expected that. But it, it's it's been a blessing. It's great. I, I wouldn't change it for anything or, or anybody. 
and and it's been the best thing that can happen to us. Has she picked up a basketball yet? <laughs> no way. Uh, I'm going to keep her out of that. My wife was a soccer star, so I'm going to let her have a soccer ball. Um, anything else she can do, I'm already not going to be able to tell her no. So whatever she wants, she got. It's, it's coming. So <laughs> it's uh, it, it's been great though. All right, Coach. Well, it was great to have you on. And, Thank uh, you. I know, I know, like you said, that has a special ring to it. Ashland Boys basketball coach, Jeremy Howe. So, Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming down. We look it. forward to working with you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. HTPT's two for the road. I'm going to go with Thabo Cephalosha, and not just because I like to say his name. <laughs> uh, what a bizarre story this past week. Cephalosha... Uh, suffered a fractured fibula and ligament damage in his in his leg, so he is out for the rest of the season. Um, when he and a teammate were arrested near the scene of the stabbing of Indiana Pacers forward Chris Copeland and two other women early April eighth in New York City, okay, and now Cephalosha is saying that police caused his season-ending leg injury, and they're the reason that he's going to miss the playoffs for the number one number one seeded Atlanta Hawks when the playoffs start here shortly, um, when, when that incident happened at the nightclub. Now, TMZ Sports released a video last week that showed a group of police officers arresting um, Cephalosha, who's a 6'7 forward. They took him to the ground, and it showed an officer in that group getting out a baton and extending it near him, but you can't really see if that actually caused the injury or not. But he's just, the, the player is shown limping away as he's led away by officers after the ruckus kind of cleared. Um, the, I don't want to get into all that with, you know, whether or not to blame the police and all that, th and all that. but uh, Cephalosha is a 31-year-old uh, veteran in the NBA. Uh, he is a contributor. He's, he's averaging five points and almost five rebounds. Is it going to really impact the Atlanta Hawks' uh, chances in the NBA playoffs. So they're the number one seed. They have 60 wins. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I don't think that it will because they have, we've talked about this before on the show, what it, what it means to be a true team. I think they really do have that. Mm -hmm. They have something special there, and there's a reason that they're the number one seed. And I really think that they'll still uh, have a very good chance. I'm not going to say that they'll be there, but have a very good chance of being in the NBA Finals representing the East. The only question I would have is there's not a lot of guys there that have positive NBA playoff experience, and Cephalosha is a veteran that's kind of been around for a while, and he's, he's had some playoff minutes. So that's a good point. That would be one issue that I would that I would wonder about, but you are there. You're right. They're so complete um, in the way they play together that you'll. it could be that they can just you know plug the next guy in and See how it goes from there. It looks like they'll play the Indiana Pacers to kick things off. Mm -hmm. Tough first round matchup for yep. one seed. Yep. Um, for my two for the rubber, we're going to look at Aaron Hernandez and um, just kind of a, as you've seen, no doubt by now, he was convicted of uh, murder this week. And the, the thing about it is that he's got two more murder charges pending. And supposedly the scuttlebutt is that those are both, you know, more incriminating evidence and more of an open and shut case than even the first one was. So. Um, it's just kind of a, you know, we've seen some of the turmoil that the New England's uh, football team has had over the last couple of years, and, and uh, Hernandez has been a, a prime member of, of that. And now you look at, you know, obviously the, the way that's turned out for him is such that, uh, you know, the New England was fine, obviously, this past year without him, but um, not to, to get too much into the on-field impact as so much as just the, the, the way that he, you know, made decisions and chose to live his life, and it's come back to, to get him and you know the legal system's not finished with him yet so it'll just be interesting to see how much further this goes. Yeah very unfortunate situation uh, for for you know everybody involved in that story um, you look at the NFL some deep-rooted issues you know I'm not saying that it's the NFL's uh, fault or they're to blame for some of these stories that have come out over the past uh, what two years right. I guess but uh, just a lot of turmoil within right. the NFL right now. Right no, you know that's been the funny thing is the Hernandez thing dates back before you know a lot of the other stuff with Ray Rice and um, Deflate Gate Peterson. and Adrian Peterson and there's just been so much this past year was was very uh, turbulent and, and certainly this doesn't help them get set in the right direction and um, it'll be interesting to see if anybody tries to pin this on Roger Goodell as well and, and kind of if his seat gets any warmer than it certainly has gotten hotter the last couple of years. Yeah, see what happens. Yeah. Well, that's going to wrap things up for us on HTPT this week. Uh, you've been watching on YouTube or the Independence Facebook page or DailyIndependent.com. We are sponsored by Fannin Automotive Family. See you next week.